Good morning, listeners. The next guests we have in the Regenerative Hour are Helen and Mike McCosker, who are pioneers, let's say, of the movement to get carbon, draw carbon back down into our soils. Helen and Mike, very welcome. You're very welcome to the Regenerative Hour. Thanks for giving us giving up your time, your very valuable time. So what's up front for you guys at the moment? G'day, Tony, and thanks for the welcome, mate. It's our pleasure to spend some time with you. Thanks, Tony. Great to be here. Great to be here. Okay, so yeah, what's up front for, I see uh, carbonate and regenerate. Re is that, have I got that correct? What, which of those, are uh, one's a, one has morphed into the other as I understand it. How is, I'll give now, you, I'll give you a little, I'll give you a little bit of the, how we fell into this process. And the story probably starts with, um, with a health problem that I had as a farmer. So I'm a fourth generation farmer in northern New South Wales and we were chemical farmers. And I had an experience where I ended up with a thyroid problem, but the thyroid problem was caused by agricultural chemicals. And that was a pivotal moment for me because I had just started to learn about um, regenerative farming techniques and how to rebuild the quality of the soil. And at the same time, I now had an experience where repairing my body or getting well from my thyroid problem involved a change of diet. And so I had a, a dietary impact which significantly improved my health. At the same time, I was learning that how we manage our soil significantly in, improves the quality of the food that we're eating. And so all of a sudden in my head, those two things got joined together. And that was a an important and pivotal moment for me. I was also working with catchment management and, um, and resource sharing issues sort of up and down the Murray-Darling Basin. So I was the chairman of the Northwest Catchment Management Committee at the time as well. And I started to discover that the soil was really important to the quality of the food and what we were doing with the soil was also impacting really heavily on the on the catchments and the river systems. And that's where we started to understand that, um, you know, the, the best indicator of soil health was actually the carbon in the soil. And over 50 years or, or the last 100 years of um, farming practice, we've been slowly but surely taking the carbon out of the soil. Yep. And that's been the chemical farming systems that we have in place now uh, are still managing to, to mine that carbon out of the soil. Whereas the regenerative agriculture turns that around and starts to put the carbon back in the soil. So as we improve our ecosystem functions and we improve what we're doing on the farm, we actually take the carbon out of the atmosphere through the plant and put it back into the soil. And that then improves the health and balance of the plants and the quality of the food coming off that plant as well. So that then starts to feed through to the health of the people that are eating that food. So all of a sudden, this whole link of, you know, the health of people and the health of society and the health of our environment all comes together through this focus of, um, you know, the measurement of carbon in the soil and getting that carbon back into the soil. So, so that was where we started to think about um, what we can do to, to help farmers. And Heli, you tell the story about how Carbonate was born. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So for those who might know, Mike and I are married. We have four children. Um, I was actually, my experience is actually an accountant and I worked in London in the UK um, and I used to round to the nearest millions and then I met Mike and we started rounding to the nearest dollar 
<laughs> but when I married Mike, I came into a farming community. Um, and I think for me, being in a community was the most important thing, understanding the whole process of regeneration. You know, we can really look big picture as to what's going on, but when we start really nurturing our communities, that's where we really start making the difference. So from our, our sort of journey, um, Mike and I were married and, um, you know, we have four small children and, you know, one day we were sitting at our kitchen table and, and we were in a pretty bad drought back in, I think it was back in 2016, 2017. And we spoke about how our community had become like a, a frog in a boiling pot. We were like, a, you know, our communities had really gotten really small. We'd lost our, our you know, the number, you know, when, when Mike was a kid, there were 30 kids on the bus. And now we were looking at four kids on the bus going to school and they were our four. So we had this conversation, you remember, Mike, about, you know, what, you know, what can we do? Let's do something really great for our community. And, and I love classical music. And I said, let's do a Baroque concert. Um, and Mike's response was, geez, darling, we're not that broke. So, <laughs> so we coined our festival the, the Not Quite Broke at Wollongra Festival. And we got funding, um, really wonderful funding. We applied for a grant and we got um, seven of our local primary schools all together. We did a schools roadshow of music and the arts and it all over a six month period and it culminated in a, a, a festival in our little local hall where we had 250 people turn up from all over and some of the kids had never even seen or heard a cello in real life. You know, this is, and this community expression in the middle of a drought, I think it transformed our community because, you know, I think just leading up to that particular event, we had, you know, it was really hard to get volunteers to be involved. We had, I think, five or six being involved in getting everything organised. The day after, we had basically 30 volunteers cleaning up and our community is only 100 strong. So that's a pretty huge, that's a real testament. So, so if we look at that very thing about connecting community and connecting um, all of that, after that particular event, we really saw the, the change and the, the way communities really wanted to engage more. And then with the drought, um, we just were like, well, what's our, what's our thing that we can really bring about this awareness around regenerative agriculture? Because Mike and I have been teaching farmers for, you know, 15 years. Mike's worked in Pacific and Asia getting farmers off chemical fertilisers. So we thought, well, the big focus needs to be on consumers and how consumers really need to understand what it is about regenerative agriculture that's so great. So we, we thought, well... Um, let's do a National Regenerative Agriculture Day, you know. And so our friend Kelly Jones, who's a, a tree changer from Melbourne, she came and, and she was at the table with us, as she always is, and we're like, how do you start a national day? <laughs> we're like, well, we'll just, we'll just start a Facebook page and, and we'll register the name of the business because I'm an accountant. And it just went from there. And basically our $200 investment in our Facebook page on the first year, we have, we've now got 10,000 strong on our National Regenerative Agriculture Day Facebook page. And it was all about farmers and foodies hijacking Valentine's Day. So how can we together inspire a real change in understanding around you know, regener regenerative agriculture and regenerative communities? So that's, that was coined two years ago. So just last month, we had our third National Day event, which was just it's so inspiring. and. You know, going back to the idea of carbonate, how carbonate was born, was because Mike and, I, Mike and I had been working in the space of, of teaching farmers. We know that in our communities, if we have some really clever and easy messaging that people can understand, because, you know, farming systems are quite complex. And if we can do it in a way that's really easy to understand, the reason why carbonate came about was because... I think, Mike, it would be good for you to share the story about our history of, of carbon levels in the soil, you know, back in the early, early, you know, when in the early 1800s, how they did measurements of carbon. Yeah, so the, the way that, that that came about, you know, with the National Regen Ag Day now a thing and, um, and 
you know, foodies and farmers hijacking Valentine's Day because we wanted all the foodies to love their farmers. But we also want all the foodies to understand that, um, you know, where they spend their food dollar is actually really, really important. So when you choose to buy organic and regenerative food, the impact you're having back at the farm level is really important because that's the signal that you're giving to the farmers that, that you don't want chemicals in the food, you don't want chemicals used in the, in the food system. And, um, and when we got to the issue of drought, well, drought becomes all about, again, the health of the soil because carbon in the soil holds water at four times its weight. So when the carbon's right down at 1% in the soil, every hectare holds about one third of a swimming pool of water. And, and when we get the carbon levels up to 8%, we're now holding three and a half swimming pools of water in the same one hectare of, of um, soil. So three and a half swimming pools of water gets you a lot further in through a, a drought or a dry time than a third of a swimming pool of water. So carbon in the soil is directly linked to our ability to, to get through a drought. And so we, we went, well, you know, carbon should be high in the soil and carbonate just started to roll off the tongue. So we went, right, oh, well, 8%, there's a target. Let's try and get all the farmers back to 8%. And some of those farmers and people said to us, well, 8%, that's just way too high. You know, we're down here at, at 1%. And, um, you know, even when, when I tested the fence line, because that was, that was what used to be here and, and it's only 5%. And what's interesting is that that's not what used to be there because when Europeans first came to Australia, very early in Europeans being here, they did a whole range of soil tests up and down the East Coast. So back in, I think it was the 18... 20s or 30s, and they did 39 soil tests up and down the east coast of Australia. The average organic matter in the soil was actually 21%. So if you bring that back to a soil organic carbon level, that's a 12% soil carbon level. So our 8% is really only getting us part of the way back to where the land used to be under the management of, of the original peoples. You know, and so that's really a testament to how we've tried to bring European farming uh, knowledge into, you know, Australia and it hasn't worked. And we've degraded this land quite dramatically. With regenerative um, management, we know we can repair the soil. So, you know, in the 10 years, um, oh, sorry, well, I've been doing this for sort of 30 odd years, teaching farmers and working with farmers. And we've seen over 10 year periods, an improvement of um, eight and 10% you know, in the soil. So we've taken soil in Fiji from um, over the 10 years, we got an average of 0.7% per year over that whole 10 years. So there's 7% increase in, in soil carbon over those 10 years. So we can certainly get ourselves back to 8% soil carbon. I also then want to talk, just share with you, Gabe Brown in America, and you mentioned you were reading Gabe's book, uh, Dirt to Soil. He had some really good um, record keeping habits. And so he actually tested the ability of his soil to absorb water when he had 1% soil carbon. That soil could take in maybe one to two inches of rain in an hour. If the rain came any faster than that, then it would run off. He's now got that soil carbon up to 9% and that same soil can take 32 inches of rain in an hour. So he could get his whole year's worth of rainfall in one hour yeah. and none of it would run off. Yeah. Mike, can we just tease this out a bit? And just so farming techniques uh, initially were based on European, what happened in Europe and European land, landscapes land, and ways of farming. 
let's have a look at the say what are the things that we talk about the in drought were so what I picked up from what you said before is that the way people were farming contributed to the drought. Have I did I pick that up correctly? Yes. Yeah. In what, so, maybe if we can tease tease that out a little bit for our listeners. Yeah. So as we've taken the carbon out of the soil through farming practices that have been drawing that carbon down. Um, what maybe what are those practices? What if we can look at those? What are the tease those out? What are the practices that have contributed to that happening? There are lots of different things that, that contribute. Ultimately, if the soil biology is not healthy and effective, then the soil structure and col uh, collapses and, and then the carbon starts to oxidise out of the soil. So um, if we... Um, if we collapse the soil structure and there's no oxygen in the soil, that kills the soil biology. You can imagine the biology is, is a living thing. So if, if we can't breathe, our, our ability to, to continue to live is severely impacted. So if we collapse the soil structure and the soil biology can't breathe, then there's a problem there. Um, that, Collapse in soil structure can happen a number of different ways. If we over farm, so um, before chemicals, it was a case of, of farming to keep the weeds out. And, and I remember my grandfather saying that at the pub, people would be skiting about how many times they'd farmed. You know, I've farmed that country 10 or 12 times in, in the fallow period. And every time you do that, it's actually collapsing the soil structure. And it's, and it's chopping up the, the biology and making it really difficult for that biology to recover. So moving to a no-till farming practice, that was a good idea, you know. That was a conservation farming idea. The problem with that is that we now rely on chemicals and the chemicals have slowly over time needed more and more chemical to kill the same weeds and we need more and more toxic mixes of chemicals to, to kill the same weeds as they've got chemical resistance. So now we're in the, the same sort of cycle, but on the chemical side of things. And we know that um, if we put stock in um, and we just leave them in a paddock and that's set stocking, then slowly but surely they take all of the good plants out of that they take all of the good plants out of that um, um, field and the, the plants get harsher and, and tougher and, and slowly but surely that field dies off as well. So set stocking doesn't work. Um, when we mimic how big grazing herds move in Africa and we move the animals around, so the animals are now rotating around the, the area and the area has a rest period with no animals on it, then that works really well. That brings the diversity, diversity back into the soil and it brings the roots back into the soil and builds the structure back again. There is a saying that says it's not the cow, it's the how. And that's a really, um, really important thing to, to get a handle on. Some people blame hard hooved animals coming into the Australian system because Australia didn't have hard, hard hooved animals. And hard hooved animals managed the wrong way do destroy soil structure. But hard hooved animals managed the right way can actually rebuild soil structure. In fact, um, Gabe Brown found that without animals in the, in the system, he could get the soil carbon back, but slowly and only to, you know, he got to about three, three and a half percent soil carbon. When he brought animals back into the system, then the soil carbon jumped from there up to sort of seven and eight and, and, and in a fairly quick period of time. So animals do work in the farming system. We just have to manage them the right way. And it's the same thing with the with the farming. We know now that there are things called crimp rollers where we can roll um, a standing crop down and make it into a weed mat 
And then with the right equipment, we can plant directly into that weed mat and, and grow our crops. So we can crop in a way that doesn't over farm and doesn't use chemicals and gets us a crop. So it's not the, it's not agriculture as a whole that causes a problem. It's how we manage different sections of agriculture. If we overuse chemicals or we overuse steel plows or we manage animals the wrong way, that's what makes a difference. So choosing regenerative um, farmers to support when you buy food or choosing organic farmers that are not using chemicals when you buy your food, they're really important choices for consumers to make. And that way that, that financial signal comes from the consumer back to the farmer that says, we don't want chemicals. Yeah. In fact, we want you to be regenerating your land, not destroying your land. So that's, you know, that's a really important thing that people can do. Yeah, everyone benefits from that. The farm yeah. as well, and yeah, all the way through. And the, the role of tree, removing trees, how, how does that contribute to drought conditions? Or does it? That's a question on, you might have to take that on notice. I don't, I don't know. No, it, it trees, are, trees yeah. are an important part of the ecosystem. And trees have become a bit of a focus in um, carbon trading, carbon credits, because they're, you know, they're easy to measure. <laughs> Whereas the soil carbon is not easy to measure. And in fact, a lot of the Australian landscape, if you read the journals of the early explorers, the early European explorers, it talks about the Australian landscape being um, rolling grasslands. So there actually wasn't a lot of tree cover on Australia in various areas. And that was probably due to the, the Aboriginal management and the burning systems. The burning systems were very different to the bushfires that we had but that burning still did affect tree cover in some places. So the tree cover is good um, and it is an important part of recycling minerals that are down low because the tree roots get a lot further into the ground. But our perennial pastures also have roots that go two and three metres down into the ground. So Australia's perennial grasses are well adapted to handle the dry climate and they're also well adapted to handling um, the soil carbon. In fact, the perennial grasses are a really big part of rebuilding the soil carbon. Um, the grasslands rebuild the carbon more quickly than, than the, the timber. In the timber, a lot of that carbon is above the ground. In the grasslands, it all gets put into the ground. Yeah. So what I'm hearing, Mike, is that there should be no bare earth. It's it should be absolutely covered. yeah. That's the key. That's the key thing. Bare ground is on the way to being a desert, and in fact, as we take the carbon out of the soil, the scientific term is that we are desertifying, and. When we've taken the carbon from 12 back to one or less than one, even area around you know, our, our core farming areas, Moree, the Darling Downs down in, in Victoria, these amazingly fertile soils are well on their way to becoming a desert. And we need to build that back again. It has so many benefits to our drought resilience, the quality of our food, and even when I was talking about how quickly the water goes in, um, that's a, 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 our flood resilience. You know, when we've got carbon in the soil, we don't have the same flooding patterns happening in the river. And now, in fact, we have river systems that are fed through underground water flow and springs. And they, those river systems will be a lot healthier. They will flow a lot longer through the drought. They'll have a baseline flow there instead of these really high fast floods and then no flow. So it just changes the whole ecosystem when we get the carbon back in the soil. And that's why we, you know, why we focused when we started to look at what we could do to help regenerate the communities, we thought, well, we've just got to get the carbon back in the soil. There are so many ancillary benefits across the board that, that help. And um, 
so that's why we, we went forward with Carbonate as, as a key focus of what we were trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah go, go for it. <laughs> I'd like to add another layer into this conversation. Um, you know, we've just, one of the themes of our National Regenerative Agriculture Day this year was sacred regeneration. Um, and that's our, the way that we connect with our Indigenous ancient history and wisdom. And, you know, you, you look at the way that our, um, our, our stories have been told in the past, you know, our, our dream time stories. And all of that beauty and understanding is all around observation. And I think the key, if we can, we can share anything for farmers, you know, who are starting this journey or foodies, it's all around observation, what we're seeing out there in our environment. Like that's so, so important. So, you know, if you, if you, under, if you want to start to really understand your waterways and how healthy, how healthy rivers are or not, just start visiting your local river. Go and go to your local creek and go on there on a regular weekly basis. You know, I... I, I've, I've been taking my kids down to our local river since I were little and I've really noticed the changes that are happening with the increased levels of farming and the, the issue of, of water. Like it's a really big issue across Australia right now, you know, the care and understanding around, around our rivers and waterways. And look, I look at me going to take my kids when they were little and the river system now and I can really see the difference. You know, the drought has had, it, it had a big impact, but there's also also other impacts so if we can actually each of us observe what's going on and as farmers we go and look at our paddocks and from a from a you know really smelling and using all of our five senses this is where our personal observations can really support everything that's going on around us you know our understanding about the way birds and biodiversity works in the landscape you know those sort of things are really crucial so when governments are looking to to make a change in a particular legislation it's all of us coming together to say, you might tell us that there's enough water allocation, that you can sell off your waters, but the reality is I'm going to my local river and I am seeing that my rivers are being affected. So no, this council cannot sell water to a big, big consultant. You know, they're the sort of things that every, each one of us can make a difference in, you know, creating impact in our environment. So that's, you know, this, this discussion around sacred regeneration and our understanding of dreamtime stories, all of that comes from observation, the way that we interact with our environment is. And so I think each one of us have a really powerful way that we can actually really make a difference. And it's in actually starting to observe what's going on around us. You know, get your kids outside, take them into the rainforest, take them into the forest, get them to look at the rivers, swim in the rivers, tell them you love the river. You know, the rivers would love to hear from everyone that they're loved because, you know, that changes the way that we think about our environment rather than feeling like we can't do anything it changes the way that we think and see and feel and do, you know. So that's really powerful for everyone, I think, to understand that. Definitely. And, it, in, and in the process, if we slow down and look at the way, like I, I reckon there's got to be a few lessons for us in uh, from maybe 100,000 years of nurturing the land, I think, there's probably a lesson or two for us in there somewhere. And, and in the process, we can, we, like in my lifetime, I reckon there's tr probably trillions of dollars that have been poured into the Aboriginal problem. And I think part of that is we just, there's been, it's a real colonial ad attitude is that we, you know, you guys know nothing. We're, we're here we're, and, you know, we'll look after you. We'll make decisions for your, about your future does, we don't have to consult you too much. You know, we, we know it all. And it's, you know, it's, it just hasn't helped one little bit. So to me, this is all part of, of regenerating a nation, really, in terms of its history. And it's, it's that, that this, the sacredness of that wisdom that, that did them, serve them very well for all those years. We've got to tap into that. And in the, in the process... Uh, whether we want to talk about reconciliation or whatever, it all flows because we're honouring the wis that wisdom, and it 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 does wonders then for s how people define themselves. They're not, you know, people that are uh, ha have have had atrocities committed against them for two hundred and fifty years. It's you know we're we're healing all that in the process. 
I'm not I sure there wasn't a question in there. There wasn't a question in there, but yeah, it's just. But I'd certainly like to share a, a, a story with you about our last regenerative agriculture um, day. Yep. And it links back to Helen spoke about this little festival we had at Wollongra and the impact that that had on the community. And I'd been working in community development for 30 years and I saw more impact on the community having a, a, a festival around music and arts than I saw in any number of government programs to build community resilience. And it started to show me that when we get together um, to sing and to share our, our creativity, our artistic abilities, that opens the heart in a way that, that we can't keep these false walls that we build up around ourselves and, and around each other. And we saw that again at this last National Regenerative Agriculture Day event. We actually had um, more by, by luck than anything, we chose a hall that sat on a boundary between two lands. And so we had the elders from two different countries come together. Because we had a, a, a bigger number of elders there, this event now, they put a bit more effort into, or we put more effort into really, the, the welcome to country. And so they shared some song with us and, and then we'd actually put into the program to get the whole hall singing a song called We Are The Earth, which is a beautiful song. And... Um, when we sang We Are The Earth, we did this, um, we, we still had all of the elders and we, I think we had uh, maybe 30 people from the mobs, local mobs there. And it really touched everybody's heart to, to have them singing to us and then us singing to them. And we had this beautiful process where one of the elders um, you know, Grandma Nellie from Uluru was so moved that she then wanted to sing a blessing for the whole group from the centre. And it was just this most amazing, heart-opening process that I don't think there was one person in that room that could say they weren't touched by that event. Yeah. So it showed me again that when we get together and share song and we share our, our cultural creativity, it takes down all the walls. Yeah. And, and that's where we get at a community level, a local community level, a real building, a real coming together and a re, real rebuilding of our community process. You can't hold some sort of racism or some sort of judgment in there around other people when you're singing with them and you're sharing your artists, artistry with them. So, you know, that showed me the power of this process in rebuilding things and repairing, you know, all of that, that um, hurt that's happened over the last 250 years, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it wasn't just in that room because I went all goosebumpy. We're in, in, and I can I could feel see it in your eyes too that like the effect that had on you and uh, yeah so and without that though the, those barriers would have been up there you know the yeah. black white barriers yeah. yeah I also should share with uh, grandmother Nellie so she's probably considered the grandmother our indigenous grandmother of Australia you know from Uluru. Mm -hmm. Um, and when she sang, it was like she sang up the song lines. And yeah. after that, it rained and rained and rained. And it also rained at Catherine for the first time in so long. So, look, we probably could accept a little bit of responsibility for that event, bringing rain and raining and raining to Catherine and across the East Coast. Yeah. Or maybe not. But, look, there no. is some, something no. magical no. happened. No. Honey Nelly. <laughs> Honey Nelly. <laughs> yeah, Honey Nelly. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we uh, we'll have to actually we'll we'll get that song and play it at some stage in this interview when it when it goes out, because I think it'll be good for people to get a sense of that. Of, We'd love of, to. Yeah, there was actually a wonderful uh, following on after the Welcome to Country just at the end of the night. Um, Uncle uh, Lewis Walker, who who played the didgeridoo at the Sydney Olympic Games. <laughs> he's a custod he's considered to be one of the custodians of the rivers of Australia. 
and there are many custodians of the rivers of Australia, but he has done um, his, his journey and his insight into how we really bring some, he's a musician and, and he and a fellow called Murray Kyle, who has traveled the world doing festivals around um, the world. He and Murray Kyle did this incredible song written by Murray and it was done without any rehearsal. And oh my God, my mum was there and she said it was like when she was in, in the 1960s when she went to the Sydney Opera House and Dame Joan Sutherland was there. So, um, and she said it was like that night, that incredible night of, you know, having this, and it was like that. Oh, everyone, we were just all, it was the most, so we'll share that clip with you. I'll get permission, but we'll have to, it was just incredible. So beautiful. Terrific. Now, I'm just very mindful of the clock at this stage. I think Mike's got to leave us and we've been, we've been going for a while. So <laughs> is there any last minute, last second messages for our listeners about, about your work and how they can help maybe? Yeah, so we've got we've got a wonderful carbonate. Our website is carbon eight with an eight dot org dot au, um, and just check out. It's a really wonderful website to learn about regenerative agriculture for those who don't know. And there's also a donate section if you'd like to donate eight dollars a month to our cause. And we are doing beautiful, amazing things. And we and like us on our Facebook page as well because we're updating all of the, the things that we're doing. Okay, no, we'll certainly do that, and we'll we'll if okay with you guys to fair, to get back to you at various stages semi-regularly to find out how how it's all going but it, it's so good to see that uh, more and more people are heading in this direction more and more farmers are seeing and we went the whole hour almost an hour without mentioning climate change or the climate emergency so <laughs> how good's that and it's just you don't even, have, you don't even have to consider it no matter it, it being the biggest problem we have to face you don't even have to mention it in this discussion because... No, it, yeah. you don't have to um, believe in climate change or not believe in climate change. It doesn't matter. If we take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in the soil, it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. You know? And I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to talk about this uh, with everybody. I, I love the fact that people care so much about our planet, you know, because... It's that caring that's going to make the difference. And if we yeah. uh, care about where we get our food, that'll certainly send a signal back to the farmers to say we don't want the chemicals and we want you to look after the planet at the same time. Yes, and hopefully Monsanto will take that message and stop trying to peddle those chemicals, those toxic chemicals all over the planet. But, I, yeah, if farmers don't buy them, they don't, they're out of business. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If, yeah. if consumers don't buy the food with the chemicals on them, the farmers won't buy the chemicals. Yeah. So that's yeah. actually where it starts, yeah. right at the grocery store. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Terrific, Mike. And thanks for your time there. And, um, yeah, we can leave it there. Helen, I wouldn't mind having continuing to chat if you've got without about a couple of other things. If you've... Absolutely. Yeah, happy to. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very Thank much. Time. No I'll pleasure. Any time, mate. Yeah. Really, any time. Speaking, yeah, with someone with you. Thank you. speaking with someone who's got that fire in his belly and, and translated through his eyes is, uh, yeah, that's the, the joy of the work that we do here. Yeah. So thanks. Helen, just, just that to, to uh, flesh that last bit out about climate change, are farmers getting the message, you know, farmers that don't believe in climate change, are they getting on board for, for reasons of their, their produce, their yeah, so this is bottom line. Yeah, I think this is the thing that if we can really show farmers that you know farmers are really, really um, smart and they're really able to change really quickly if they can see it in their their you know in their dollars. So if 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 they're seeing the the whole demand the the you know from the demand perspective from foodies if they're seeing that they can make more money from growing food that's nutrient dense and food that actually you know they're growing um that what they're growing is actually transforming the environment and they also they get potentially environmental credits for all of those there's like this all you know farmers have different uh, motivations for doing things you know there might be farmers out there that have been conventional farmers for a long time 
and they've been doing what they can and they're not really knowledgeable about the regenerative agriculture side. But if they're seeing now that they can actually be rewarded for the way that they farm, then that will change in an instant, you know. And the, the tricky thing with regenerative agriculture is, is it's not a, there's no silver bullet with it. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a long term, you know, to get into a, a regenerative, you know, change your, changing your farm happens really, it can take sometimes for up to three years. You know, it's, it's not like I'm going to stop putting chemicals on my farm straight away because there, there's flow on effects with that. So there's, there's a real process and understanding around that. So, you know, our farmers can, all farmers, if they understand a process and they work with the process and can understand that they will get paid more because they can make more money out of, you know, the food that they produce that's done in a regenerative way then that's when we'll start seeing the real change, the big change. And I've got to say that I look at my experience of having worked with farmers and it feels for, for me like a bit of an overnight success in 20 years. You know, that you know when you have a, a best-selling book? Because back going back five years when we had when we used to organize, you know, these field days. You get 10 and 20 farmers in at a time and we were, you know, trying to teach them about sustainable and regenerative practices. But what's so exciting now is that we're seeing, you know, in the last probably 18 months to two years, we're starting to see big, you know, farming numbers in, with field days, up to 50, 100, 150 farmers turning up. They're all being sold out. You know, the, the field days are getting sold out straight away. You've got to get your tickets in quick. So that is a testament to us as farmers showing us, you know, we're showing up. We're prepared to put in the hard yards to, to, to be part of this transition and this change. And particularly our younger generation, like, you know, used to be, you know, our farming communities were very much the older generation. And now we're seeing the younger generation come through and they're part of, they're leading this whole change on, you know, calling out their dads sorry, oh great, you know, saying we can't keep on doing this. And, you know, even from the stories of, of the, the issues of, of the illnesses, you know, the elephant in the room of our farmers having cancer, you know, all the generational farmers are dying from cancer and all of the issues around chemicals and, and the younger generation seeing that, you know, with their kids, they don't want to spray, they don't want to spray crops when their kids are around. So everyone's starting to really look at it with a different lens. Yeah. So it's really exciting to see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you've been, it must be uh, a source of great joy for being part of that and, and one of the, the pioneers in, in leading that. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of pioneers. I mean, <laughs> um, I'm probably, I take the view that we've, you know, I think with a mentoring process, you always have someone that you learn from. Yeah, absolutely. And, and all of all of that, and I am I'm really I feel very humbled and proud to be have been in this been part of the journey for so long, um, and I feel like you know I'm also really aware that it's also important how we teach our children. You know, right now we're in, and I probably this could resonate with a lot of mums out there right now, but this this issue of being having kids on devices and inside all the time is something that is a problem for all all parents i think i think tony if you've got kids you'd agree mm. and i think us this uh, this this um thing about about how we start actually really seeing nature it's really important now that our kids even our farming kids like we're going to have a whole farming generation where we're not going to have any farmers because our kids are all indoors so it's really important from the farming perspective of getting our kids outside you know if they were mustering we take them all out and and the same with that with city parents who have got young kids you know how much joy they get out of going into the park you know when they go to the park and they're playing and outside and how it changes everyone's mental health you know being in nature is just such an important thing so you know that's probably another thing that i would really like to if there are any farming families out there to make sure you know i've got kids aged from 9 to 15, 16, and one of the big things that we're really focusing on right now is to get our kids outside, be part of the learning around what, you know, in the farm. And because we don't use so much chemicals now, it's actually great to get them out on the bikes and, you know, mustering and doing all of that stuff that needs to be done on the farm, you know. And, and you know, we're not taking that for granted by any means. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And there's a lot of uh, networks being that have evolved of... of um mentoring each other, like learning together. 
farmers doing that together. And that's that's a really great antidote to uh, to mental illness, feeling like you're the only one that's doing it. And it's yeah, that's right. I think that the, this mental illness is a big. It plays a big part in the farming story. You know, and I think this is where the magic of, of how we engage at a community level yeah. um, is so important. You know, I think that when we start sharing success stories on the farm and, and, and failures, if we're all talking about it and we're seeing, we're actually seeing what's going on. You know, when we came out of the drought, our farm responded so much quickly. Like we had, you know, we've gotten straight in with our cover crops, our multi-species crops. And, you know, we're just seeing how quickly and resilient our pastures and our farming land has recovered. And even, you know, like, like the devastation during the drought of seeing so many dead trees, how, how much that took each of it, like to see that devastation takes a personal toll, has taken a personal toll on all of us. Yeah. Now, like all of those trees that look like they died, they're actually all growing back. You know, I just think one of our one of our things with carbonate is we say that take heart for the Earth's ability to regenerate has been vastly underestimated. And you know, when we when we work with nature rather than against nature, we just see remarkable things happening. And you know, we can call it magic, or we can call it spirit, or we can call it you know just nature. But you know, call it whatever you want. We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but we're just, you know, I think this is where we want to really blow our horn right now and just say that regenerative agriculture and regenerative communities is the very thing that's going to get us through all of this stuff, you know. And if people are concerned about climate change or they're concerned about COVID or whatever it is, you we just, you know, take that heart because if we're all involved and together talking to each other about it, that's where we're going to make the big change. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's and just... Through that interaction, we just see that there are, like, none of the barriers are insurmountable. That if we work, we face them together. The none are insurmountable. And right now, that one of the biggest barriers are, is uh, our politicians and their lack of real action. So it's the same thing as you alluded to before. That individuals can join together and put pressure on them to do, because like the approach at the moment is just future generations will look back and say that how did that happen <laughs> great absolutely so yeah. yeah i think and everyone know knowing that they've got the power in their hands and not feeling you know it's quite a fearful time and space right now and just understanding that hey i can actually make a difference whether it's you know taking my kids to the park and getting or taking them to the river and telling them we love the river or you know buying the food in our gross going to your local um, farmers markets going to the butcher and asking for grass-fed meat. There's so many things that you can do at an individual individual level, you know. So, yeah, yeah. but ob the power of observation right now, looking, looking at our nature through a totally new lens, you know, that's powerful. Yeah. And just on the talk about animals, I'm, I'm in uh, Extinction Rebellion. I'm, I do a lot of training, nonviolent direct action training there. And there's a lot of people that have that are really climate concerned that have become vegan they've stopped eating meat and it's hard to get the message through to them about about because of the the methane issue um, but it's really really pleasing to see recently the research that's being done that say if, if cows eat grass there's less of a methane problem the the methane comes from what they're fed in more a lot more from what they when they're fed in feedlots but also feeding things like seaweed to them are you across any of that at all <laughs> yeah we're really aware of all of that you know the 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 diet that cattle get is really crucial you know and grass fed um particularly from the point of view of how you know there's this a uh, vitamin b12 um, which is really important in our diets. And the only way that you can get vitamin B12 is actually through um, grass-fed, um, well-fed beef. You can't get it, you can get some synthetic B12, but you can't get it any other way apart from through grass-fed beef. And this B12 is such an important, it's all about the nerves and how we, so, um, you know, the conversation around vegans is a tricky one. Um, I, I am really, 
you know, there's there's lots of different layers about the reasons why people are vegan, and that's really really important to understand that. Also, understanding that that you know some of the vegan diets around, you know, there's really high soy protein. Soy protein is a, um, a conventionally grown um, soy um, soybeans, which are absolutely hammered with fungicides, mm. and they put so much chemical to, into it. And the effect it has on our landscapes and in the waterways is terrible. So, you know, if you are vegan, and obviously you, you, you have done some research, one of the things that's really important as a vegan is to always eat um, preferably your own homegrown food, firstly. Secondly, it needs to be organic. You can't, you know, that. And also then have a look into how important it is to have you know, um, some meat in your diet because of that. Though there's there's really important nutrients that you just can't get in a vegan diet. You know, and also I'm also aware that there have been um, societies in um, you know in Thailand in Asia that have been a vegetarian all their lives. So you know, the thing is that you've got to get your high nutrient dense foods in if you're what whether you're vegan, vegetarian, or a meat lover. That's the key. You yeah. just got to look at you could, your diet is a representation of what's going on in your environment, basically. So that's my suggestion. My yeah. Yep. Terrific. Thanks, Helen. Like I said before, we'll follow the, what you guys are doing with a great amount of interest, and and look forward to those numbers turning going from ten thousand to fifty, hundred, five hundred <laughs> thousand, million. As, as they need to, do, as they need to do, and you know we've all got to find our way of of being part of the solution, and that can that is a, an important way. It's yeah, thanks, Jane. Support in support for you guys. So we could we we could leave the interview there and um, catch up with you down the track. Yeah, it's such a pleasure speaking to you, Tony, and thank you um, to all those people listen, listening. Um, it's always we're just so. We live and breathe regenerative agriculture at Carbonate because we are farmers ourselves. I think we're one of the few charities that are actually farmers working in the space. So we're really proud of what we've achieved, Kelly and, and me and Mike and our incredible board. We've got an awesome board that we work with. So I'm just like to be in this space right now. It actually gives me a lot of joy and excitement, all the projects that we've got going on. And so if you'd like to sign up as a volunteer as well, that's something that we're looking to put towards a, a volunteer group. So we're passionate about that as well. So that can help something, you know, individually as well. Okay, let's, let's, have a, that's another, an <laughs> that's avenue another to thing. Go down. What, what, would have, what, your volunteers, what are you looking at them for? Well, there's a number of projects that we can help um, get outreach online as well as, you know, community projects. So, you know, organize, individually organising an event for National Regenerative Agriculture Day. So that's a long term thing that getting restaurants on board, getting, you know, uh, schools involved, you know, there's and we're starting our Regenerators Club. So getting kids involved in in an awareness around regenerative agriculture. So supporting, there's lots to be done. Okay. We've got lots of work to do out there. <laughs> all of that, we could find all of that at carbonate.org.au. Yeah, there's, and so our email address is g'day at carbonate.org.au. So right. there we are. We've even got an email address. And just just the last point, we if people donate $8 a month, which isn't a lot. Yep. What? So you that accumulates for you, and what what do you guys do with that? Yeah, so we have a number of projects going. We've just um, have we got time to talk, <laughs> Tony? I don't know how much time we've got. Yeah, well, it's up to you. I'm I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. So we've got we've actually just um, uh, work working with a, a protected habitats mutual farmers mutual, and getting farmers signed up so that we can start looking at ways in which farmers can get environmental credits. So that means it, it, helping farmers um, get, you know, do the measurements, all that sort of thing. So we're supporting that. So part of the farmers signing up to that, um, our, as a carbonate farmer, they get the benefits of, we, we actually help um, farmers into that whole process. We're also, um, you know, the National Region Ag Day is one of our key projects. And we're also working on um, a number of different um, sort of, it's like a cert, uh, uh, the carbonate certification pr process, which is a regenerative cer certification that has seven stars. So that certification is really going to be crucial because we're looking at outcomes-based certification. Yep. And that 
And so that is something that we're about to launch. So all of that funding goes directly into these really important projects. Yeah. And are there any uh, any engagement with super funds and, and things like and things like that where people can which can generate funds that support the farmers to, to make the changes, the necessary changes? Yeah, so this is the foundational stuff that we're all they're all we're all working on right now to to actually be able to get some environmental credits and carbon credits so that we can now then start interacting with our super funds. And that's probably a longer term thing because we need to, to you know, we need to get all of that better down, but that's certainly our next our next process, definitely. I think future super, and that, that's a conflict of interest there, I think that's something they'd be very interested in, in talking about. Yeah, great, great. Mm. Okay. Okay, Tony. Yeah, and I'll just, there's a couple of other things, but I can't talk, it seems like I can't get Biggie to turn off that recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll just let him know that we're, we're coming to the end of the of yeah. our, our meeting. Yeah, it's just connecting with some of the, we're doing a, a series two on talking to First Nations people, and, and this will really feel, so we're looking for, content. we've got a, a number, and everyone we, we talk to leads to a, a number of others. So if any of those, um, the auntie that did the singing or or the the guy, I didn't get his name, the guy who did... Lewis Walker. Yeah, we've, yeah got a number of, we've got a number of the mob that would love to. We've actually just started to train them into some of the, the funds that Carbonate put towards was like just a podcast, an ability for some of our mob to do live podcasts. So... Okay. That was one of the things that we're we're sort of looking at. Um, so we're really happy to collaborate on that, getting out, get, getting our, our indigenous um, guys to share their stories. They're so important. They are, and I could talk to to Mick about this, but we could be easily be part of that, of working with them to so they're kind of billing it to empowering them to do that. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, if you, need, if you need assistance on that front. Yeah, thank you. That'd be awesome. Okay. We'll talk offline about that one. Okay, all great. Right. Thanks very much. And I don't know whether we're big, big, big. That's all right. Biggie does his thing. He knows exactly what to do. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Terrific. Thanks, Tony. Such Wait, a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.